going. Are you all right at the back? Good, thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm Barbara Altman, the new director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight for the first of two Oregon Humanities Center Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Lectures in Art and American Culture this year. The O'Fallon Lecture was established by a generous gift from Henry and Betsy Mayer, Meyer, I beg your pardon, named Mayer? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And these people who are correcting me know, as I will tell you in just a moment. Uh, named in memory of their nephew Colin, son of University of Oregon law professor Jim O'Fallon and his wife and artist um, Ellen Thomas. In alternate years, the lecture focuses on the topic of either American jurisprudence or art. This year, the topic is art. I'm very happy to acknowledge the large extended O'Fallon family of which there are at least 10 members by my count here in the audience, both down at the front and up in the back. For this first of our O'Fallon lectures this year, our guest is Professor Henry Jenkins, who is the Peter de Flores Professor of Humanities and founder of the Comparative Media Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Jenkins was scheduled to speak here last year, and many people were disappointed when he was unable to come. We're particularly pleased to have him with us at last, and I'll keep my introduction very short in order to leave him every opportunity to explore his topic. Of his many accomplishments, I mention here only a sampling of his many books on various aspects of media and popular culture, including textual poachers, television fans, and participatory culture, hop on pop, the politics and pleasures of popular culture, and from Barbie to Mortal Kombat, gender and computer games. His latest offering is Convergence Culture, where old and new media collide, which was published in 2006. I can't think of anyone more compelling to listen to on the eve of this crucial election. Professor Jenkins shows compelling arguments in Convergence Culture to demonstrate how new forms of communication and digital technologies have created an election like no other, in which the generation of new voters have unprecedented access to and influence on the campaign, on the outcome, and perhaps on the way we conduct politics in this country from now on. I must mention that Jenkins walks the walk and talks the talk. He is a totally devoted fan of popular culture and a great spokesperson for fandom and the ways fans interact with the material that fascinates them. You will see Aka Fan as the title of his blog, um, which is of course a, a, a melange of mixing of academic and fan. He also lives with his wife in the senior residence at MIT, which puts him squarely in the middle of a group of young people among the most technologically savvy anywhere. Before I give him the podium, I'd like to express great appreciation to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center who pursued Professor Jenkins and organized every aspect of this trip. My thanks to Julia Hayden, Melissa Gustafson, and Peg Yearhart for bringing us this wonderful speaker. Professor Jenkins was good enough to do a 30-minute interview with me this afternoon for our TV show, UO Today, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to watch that interview when it airs in a few weeks. I also want to mention that there will be a book signing and book sale of Professor Jenkins' work. The sale uh, books are out that door on my left, your right, and Professor Jenkins will be down here for the signing at the end of the talk. Now, without further preamble, please join me in welcoming Professor Henry Jenkins and his talk entitled Talking Snowmen, Moose Stew, and the 3 a.m. Girl, New Media, Popular Culture, and American Politics, 2008. Well, thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm sure that everyone is preoccupied with tomorrow's events, uh, but it's, it's a good a way as any to uh, sort of think through the year we've just gone through, which has been probably the most curious and interesting election cycle that I've, I've certainly observed in my, my time. I should note that while I have an undergraduate degree in political science, I am a media scholar by training, and so the approach I take to this, the notion of campaigns is very, very different. Um, I discovered when I was in an undergraduate that I really liked politics and couldn't quite fit within a political science department. Uh, that The science part sort of tripped me up every time. But 
I have this, and being a media scholar has given me a chance to each election cycle to go in and really give talks around the country to sort of talk about the role that media plays. Uh, as a media scholar, I think they're, one of the things that you quickly discover is that wars and campaigns are the two things that really push forward innovation and new technological platforms. That if you look at the turning points of media history, those two events, more than any other, change the landscape. And they certainly become moments to take an inventory and understand how the media system is operating in a sophisticated way. I think that's in part because if we want to look at the four groups that drive media change, uh, the top four, I would suggest, are churches, pornographers, advertisers, and politicians, who each, for their own reason, have to want to reach out and change their interface with the public, uh, but who are willing to take the early adapters and adopters of technology and push them in new directions. And so, uh, in, in that context, what I want to do tonight is give you some snapshots of the campaign as it's unfolded this year talk particularly about the use of new media and about the blurring of the lines between politics and popular culture, which I think has defined our current moment politically. Um, and I'll begin with a very, very brief and sketchy history of uh, the political culture of the United States. The first image there of, of a mediated election is the election between Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln. And we often talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates as this landmark in civic discourse and high, lofty ideals. But keep in mind that it was occurred in a totally carnivalous setting. There would have been sword swallowers and flame eaters and fireworks and fighting competitions taking place all around that. And so even at that moment, we would see the blurring of the lines between political culture and popular culture. The second image I have there is of Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivering one of the fireside addresses. And I think if we talk about the history of media and politics, we'd have to talk about Roosevelt as the person who capitalized on radio as a technology and recognized that radio allowed him to speak directly from the White House to the homes of voters around the country and as sort of one of those landmarks. Um, in fact, in my own background, when my grandfather passed away, uh, there were four things in his desk that I think sort of spoke to his generation. One was the King James Bar Bible, carefully marked to indicate the number of times he'd read it cover to cover. This is a guy with a fourth grade education. The second was a union card. The third was the collected speeches of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the fourth was a picture postcard of Will Rogers. And, and those things together, I think, capture a generation, and again, a generation for whom politics and popular culture were sharply fused. It's worth remembering on this occasion that Will Rogers explained that he was not a member of an organized political party, he was a Democrat, <laughs> suggesting that some jokes never age, uh, and that indeed there's something that's true about the party structures and their temperaments. As we move forward in our little brief history of politics and media, we have to talk about the rise of broadcast television as a technology, as embodied mythically by the debate between Nixon and Kennedy in 1960, which many people have said uh, Nixon won the debate on radio and lost it on television, and then the Kennedy's telegenic qualities changed the tide of that particular election. And as we move deeper into the broadcast era, we'd want to talk about Ronald Reagan, so the so-called great communicator, someone who was himself an entertainer, someone who comes from the movie industry. And what he did perhaps more powerfully than words was really drew on the power of images and narrative to construct a kind of image culture for American politics. People noted that it almost didn't matter what Reagan said, that as long as the pictures were strong, uh, they could go forward, and, his, and George Bush the first George Bush took that to the logical extremes, not a very articulate guy, but someone who could create, whose staff created powerful images, like filming him in a flag factory or cruising through the polluted Boston Harbor. And then we get to Bill Clinton, who I would argue was the first cable television candidate, uh, who really exploited, whether it was Arsenio Hall, then on Fox, or MTV, or C-SPAN, or Nashville Network, used a variety of different cable channels to reach very specific niche audiences. And his power was to unify a variety of special interest groups through these very specialized appearances. The image here, of course, is his famous appearance on Arsenio Hall. 
And what was interesting about that appearance is he had not 60 minutes of television at the beginning of the campaign in which he engaged in a very serious and lengthy discussion of the LA riots, race in America, his economic policies, at the end of which he played the saxophone. <laughs> now, the news media only revealed the story of saxophone and then claimed that Arsenio Hall had trivialized American politics. Uh, when in fact, it seems to have been the national news who picked up on the saxophone and discarded all of the things that he said to a black constituency that had tuned in to watch him on Arsenio Hall. And this is a story that plays out to the present day. The, it's sort of a tendency to take the most trivial bits of uh, sort of pop culture appearances and ignore the substance of what took place. So this brings us to, to uh, the, the last presidential cycle, uh, and which I write about somewhat extensively in the last ch one of the last chapters of my book, Convergence Culture. The images here suggest a variety of things that were taking place in the final days of that campaign. First, we see in the center there a very graphic image of Howard Dean, who was a candidate who built his following on the web and lost it on television. That Howard Dean raised a massive amount of money and spent it on television advertising. That he, he posted really provocative things on the web that people wanted to talk about. And then they, they get soundbited on TV, which helped to bring about his downfall. But the final step, of course, was the so-called scream heard around the world after uh, his appearance in Iowa, uh, which quickly was then used on the web and on the, and the internet as a site of parody. And this is one of many Photoshop collages that surrounded the scream uh, moment, uh, juxtaposing it with another famous moment of that same, same year, the, the so-called clothing malfunction during the Super Bowl. We see next to that uh, the true majority dot com website. And True Majority was an interesting organization four years ago, founded by Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, which whose principle was using serious fun to break down the, the sort of educate people about the political process. And they most famously produced a video that used The Apprentice to talk about the election in which Donald Trump fires George W. Bush uh, and used it to raise questions about whether he was competent to perform his job. And this was presented as something that would be passed along from user to user. The, the, the hope was that people would spread this video across the web, and then because it was witty and playful, it would engage more people. We also see here this land, which was the first of Jib Jab's uh, political satire videos. And Jib Jab was another group that was using so-called viral media content and parody in that election cycle to sort of change the terms by which people understood the election. And the final image there is from the last season of The West Wing, which is a little after the election, but I think it's really interesting to look back on. The last season of The West Wing focused on the presidential campaign to replace Jed Bartlett. And uh, the candidates were an Alan Alda performing the part of a John McCain-like Republican, and uh, Jimmy Smith's playing the part of an Obama-like Democrat. Uh, and they actually had a, an hour-long live debate between these candidates. Uh, and basically, it turns out that both McCain's people and Obama's people were used, consulted with West Wing and taught them some, used them to test market strategies and to try out language that they thought would appeal across party lines. And, and so they were using West Wing as a test market for the current campaign. And so it's fascinating to go, in a sense, the campaign we're in right now is a rerun of West Wing uh, from three years ago. And, if you want to know how it turns out, the, the Obama-like character wins the election, and on that evening, his vice president passes away, and in order to unify the country, he names the McCain figure as his vice president. So we'll see if that actually works in the real world. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to be Joe Biden tomorrow night if this, uh, the rest of the things that have come true on West Wing happen. So this is a cartoon from four years ago that points to a significant difference of what's happened over the last four years, right? We see the youth vote, Bush wins, overslept again, the, the, the Democratic donkey complains. And this is the way politicians have thought about young voters throughout most of its history, that, that young people often promise they're gonna vote and they don't deliver. Now this go round, we've seen quite the opposite, that the participation of young voters during the primary season was quite spectacular. Some of the, the highest levels of voter participation we've seen of young people since they got the right to vote. And in many states around the country, more 18-year-olds voted than senior citizens. We're also seeing significant patterns of young people turning out 
in early voting in those states where it's allowed, suggesting that there will, this will be the time that, broke the dif that made the difference. In fairness, four years ago, many young people voted. And in fact, there was a dramatic increase in that last election. And MTV's uh, Choose or Lose campaign more than surpassed its quota in terms of registering young voters. The difference was that what people weren't paying attention to was churches and swing states were also registering voters and also had a better ground system that, that brought people to the polls. So young voters were swamped in the last election. And the question is, what will happen this, this go round in terms of young people's participation? Now, the MTV folks shared with me recently the statistic of those people who follow Choose or Lose. These are 18 to 27-year-old voters who are following the Choose or Lose campaign. What they found was this, this particular constituency, 89% watched cable news programs, 87% watched evening news shows on the major networks, 78% read newspapers, 61% used blogs, sent or received text, used social networking sites for political purposes, 59% watched The Daily Show or The Colbert Report, 49% read a political blog, 25% made political contacts on Facebook or MySpace, 24% sent or received text messages related to politics, and 14% posted on a political blog. And that's a snapshot of the sheer range of different media this campaign's been conducted on and the, no, and the kind of level of political engagement and civic awareness that young Americans have been involved with following this election. And I think a lot of that has to do with the key ideas I'm gonna talk about tonight, the use of new media and the blurring of the lines between poli political and popular culture. Now, Lance Bennett, who's a political scientist at the University of Washington, sort of says that we're in a period of time in which the model of what a citizenship looks like has shifted from uh, what he calls the dutiful citizen model, which was that of the post-war generation for whom they felt it was an obligation to participate in government-centered activities, voting was the core democratic act, uh, so forth, and a new what he calls actualizing citizen, where voting is one part of a larger set of political activities one's involved with, there may be a less a sense of obligation to vote, but increasingly voting is seen as a way of self-realization. Uh, but the biggest shift is moving from an era of civic organizations to an era of social networks. And this is, I think, a way of thinking about what it means to be political in the current context. And I'm gonna say a little more about that as we go forward, but I think that's sort of useful as a backdrop for thinking about it. Now, I want to take you back to last fall, actually early fall, late summer, when one of the, to my mind, one of the landmarks of the election season was the CNN YouTube debates. They're interesting as, as in the transitional moment, and we think about this way this campaign is played out across media, because we have a partnership between mass media, CNN, you know, major news network, and YouTube, the symbol of the new participatory culture. And the fact that those two teamed up to create a new approach to the political debate uh, sort of signals the, the kind of transitions that are taking place in the media landscape. So what YouTube, what YouTube offered was a chance for average Americans to film videos, put them on the web, and from those videos would be chosen the questions that would be asked to the candidates. Now, unlike, say, a town hall meeting debate where the citizen is brought into a political space, the citizen, in this case, is able to control the setting of their video. They film them in their own bedrooms, their living rooms, their kitchens. They're able to shape the media in a very caref careful way and throw it out to the world. This, the, the people who are doing these things come from a variety of backgrounds, having bought home movie cameras, having played around with fan videos and skateboard videos and a variety of other things, use that to put it out there. 4,000 people chose to submit videos for the Democratic debate. And hundreds of thousands of people chose to watch those videos and weigh in about which ones they thought were important questions. So early in the campaign, YouTube was playing an important function in terms of generating awareness of the, the candidates. Now, the evening of the debate, a lot of interesting things went down. And this is a story somewhat like uh, the story about Clinton playing the saxophone. We saw some really interesting questions about Darfur, which were one of the first, only times that Darfur surfaced in a presidential debate in the entire season. There were discussions about minimum wage and whether it was possible for the president to live in the White House on a minimum wage. There were some interesting conversations on gun control and on gay and lesbian rights. Uh, but in the midst of it, the most famous, when the following morning, 
everyone wanted to talk about the snowman, right? And the snowman video had been the most discussed video of the evening. The snowman basically was an animated question that described, uh, glo talked about global warming and whether global warming would doom the future of the snowman's child. Uh, and it was asked to Dennis Kucinich, uh, who followed up with a discuss discussion of global warring uh, and only gradually pulled it back to the future of snowmen. Now, Dennis Kucinich, it's worth noting, four years ago famously took a visual aid to a radio debate. So he's not necessarily the most adept at uh, thinking about media and its properties. Um, but, you know, and, you know, nevertheless, it was an interesting exchange. But the, the, the aftermath of it is worth playing out. And I'm going to play a little bit of a video here that shares with us what happened after the debate. Okay, here's hoping. Well, he was the breakout star of the CNN YouTube Democratic presidential debate. And now he's trying to make sure a Republican shows up for his turn on stage. It's a most unusual face-off between Mitt Romney and a snowman. Here's CNN's Jeannie Mose. Happy Chill out, Frosty. Frosty the snowman. There's a new snowman in town. A snowman challenging a Republican presidential candidate. Hello, Mitt Romney. If Billiam the snowman looks familiar, you probably saw him at the CNN YouTube presidential debate. Hello, Democratic candidates. Billiam was the one asking about global warming. What will you do to ensure that my son will live a full and happy life? <laughs> Billiam stole the show. Some found him abominable. Some proclaimed him the debate's winner. He ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. As for that voice... They wanted to come up with kind of an annoying voice. Don't do it! This was Billiam's first video, pre-YouTube debate. Two Minneapolis guys, Nathan and Greg Hamill, created him. Greg supplied the voice and he also... Mm -hmm. ...lopped off Billiam's head and then replayed it in slow motion. The guys then adapted that same snowman footage with his animated carrot lips to relay their YouTube question. But at least one Republican candidate gave the snowman the cold shoulder. Mitt Romney isn't yet sure he can fit a YouTube debate into his schedule. I, I think the snowman is perhaps a little, a little less than the, uh, the, the, the level of dignity you expect in a presidential uh, televised debate. To which the snowman says, Lighten up slightly. Who came up with that lighten up slightly mm -hmm. stuff? He did. <laughs> he being Mitt Romney. Romney used the phrase when he was being attacked for having his picture taken next to someone holding a sign saying, no to Obama, Osama, and Chelsea's mama. You know what? Lighten up slightly. Lighten up slightly. We thought that it would be kind of a nice taste of his own medicine. So here you've got two guys who like to make wacky YouTube videos. Lawn chair jousting. Dressing up a mm -hmm. snowman. That's your mom's hat, really? Yeah. And jousting with a presidential candidate. Their snowman has inspired knockoffs. Don't be scared of Mr. Frosty. You can even buy snowman t-shirts that say, save me. But if he keeps getting a frosty reception, chances are he won't melt into oblivion anytime soon. Lighten up slightly. Genimo, CNN, <laughs> New York. Right, so, Ooh, ouch. <laughs> we asked a Romney spokesman to weigh in. He said, we don't reply to snowmen. Apparently, they haven't lightened up slightly. Well, he was the breakout star. Oops. All right, so, so fascinating story, really, of the blurring of the lines between the culture of YouTube and the culture of CNN. Uh, just to sort of walk through some of the responses to the snowman. Here's Mitt Romney. I think the presidency ought to be held to a higher level than having to answer questions from a snowman. The producer said, I think running for president is serious business, but we do want to know that the president has a sense of humor. And the snowman was picked up by a number of bloggers and by the Huffington Post is emblematic of the way that CNN's handling of the debate had trivialized the political process. So the snowman became literally the fulcrum for some interesting debates. Part of what the debate was about was this question of what's, what, what constitutes legitimate political discourse and who should decide. What's interesting about the CNN debates was while the questions were submitted through YouTube, there was no user-moderated system in place. The questions are actually selected by CNN producers. And so many in the blogosphere challenged CNN for not paying sufficient attention and support for the actually democratic potential of users making their own decisions. Romney himself 
um, seemed to be perplexed about which new media platform he was attacking. Going, sounding off in another interview about child predators on YouTube, clearly having confused it with MySpace, another bete noir of Republican cultural warriors. Um, and so it, it sort of mashed them together. But the same week he was attacking YouTube as a platform for the debate, his campaign off, launched a choose your own campaign theme song competition, which was using the same Web 2.0 mechanisms of user generated content. Um, the, you know, CNN producers, on the other hand, said that the reason they needed to play gatekeeper in this process was that the questions being submitted by the public were often trivial. They said if we went purely by the number of site hits on the site, we'd end up with questions about whether Arnold Schwarzenegger was really a Terminator and whether aliens really arrived at Roswell. Uh, both videos that were extremely popular, or this one, which was very popular, in which a Viking asked questions about immigration. Uh, the, the, in a sense, part of what, and to sort of understand that, we have to understand the relationship that's been established between new media and old media. As you open up a space for public participation, one of the first reflexes is one of negation. That is, can we force old media to act against its own interest? And so the public was very knowing, I think, on these jokes, trying to push these videos up to see if they could force CNN to air them. The parallel is to the Vote for the Worst campaign, which has taken place around American Idol. Um, many people have noted um, that more people vote for American Idol than vote for the American president. That's actually not true. There are more votes cast for American Idol, but since you can vote as many times as you want, uh, I dare say if many of the people in the room could take your speed dial tomorrow and punch it for the next 12 hours, that a lot of you would probably do it for whichever candidate of your choice is. And we have much higher participation in the American presidential election than we have in American Idol. But what happened that's interesting in American Idol was this group emerged called Vote for the Worst, which organized online to keep bad singers on television as long as possible. Right? And they used a variety of media platforms to get people to vote for singers they thought were terrible to sort of force the network show down the, down the toilet, ratings-wise, by uh, sustaining bad singing all along. Now, their argument is that American Idol, in fact, starts the full first half of the season as bad singers. It exploits them regularly so that they were simply serving the same interest as the producers, but that they were doing it at a different point in the run of the series. And indeed, ratings suggest that there are different, almost entirely different audience watches the first half of the American Idol season and the second half. They have different interests. But, so that's negation. And we could see the CNN videos, the sort of YouTube videos on Roswell as a kind of negation of the political process. Now, mass media responds by a politics of marginalization. And one of the things that CNN did at the very beginning of the YouTube debate was to have a series of flashing images of videos they rejected, including the video of this guy uh, who calls himself Anonymous American. And Anonymous, you see here a rather colorful response from Anonymous American th via YouTube, there being the ways in which his words were stripped aside and his image was left. Now what's interesting about Anonymous American is that wrestling mask. And he said, there's a number of things he says on, in the video about the wrestling mask. The first was that he wanted to signify, he wanted A to be an everyman and not to be an individual. The, secondly, that uh, he wanted to signify the silencing of free speech under the Bush, Bush administration and saw the mask as a way of doing it. And third, that there's a strong tradition in Mexico of wrestlers becoming political activists and defenders of the social oppressed. And he wanted to use that imagery for very specific cultural and political reasons. So he felt that when they stripped his words aside and just showed it on television, none of the meaning of the gesture was left and they simply marginalized and dismissed him as a political agent as if he was trivializing the process again, rather than allowing him to speak what he said. Now, of course, the interesting thing about YouTube is that the video was still there, and he had a platform by which he could continue to respond to CNN and challenge their representation of it. And he got a significant number of hits, at least thousands of hits, from people who turned in to hear his side of the story. So that nothing, the, 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 the difference between a world where the footage would end up on the cutting room floor in a world where YouTube as a platform allows the, the people like this to continue to express their views. Now the interesting backstory behind the snowman, to walk us through that story just for a minute, the story of YouTube was inspired by Mr. Bill. And many of you who are of a certain age will remember Mr. Bill as cl a classic series of sketches on the original Saturday Night Live. 
Now, what you probably don't remember is that Saturday Night Live early on ran a contest for home movies. And then Mr. Bill was amateur produced content that user generated content that was submitted to Saturday Night Live. They liked him so much, they commissioned the amateur to produce 20 videos of Mr. Bill that sort of ran through the first several seasons on Saturday Night Live. So he became a recognizable figure in popular culture, but he originated from an amateur media producer. Now, several years ago, Mr. the creator of Mr. Bill brought the character out of retirement to become an environmental activist. And in, in the South, American South ran a series of videos commenting on the wetlands issues affecting Mississippi and Louisiana using the Mr. Bill character. So there's a reason why the snowman who sounds like Mr. Bill got chosen to represent the question of global warming, that there's a political trajectory behind it that would have informed and inspired these kids in Minnesota. Now what these kids did, we see this trajectory in that CNN footage from making sort of goofing around videos in their backyard to turning that into a political tool for the debates to realizing they had a political platform, that the news media was going to pay attention to the snowman, especially with Mitt Romney protesting the snowman. And so they used that to produce a series of videos that challenged Mitt Romney. And the lighten up video that they were being seen there, they said it went through it really quickly, but the basic story was in New Hampshire, Someone, show, an amateur showed up at a Mitt Romney rally holding a sign saying no to Obama, Osama, and Chelsea's mama. Another, a progressive blogger took that picture, put it on their blog, it was beginning to get traction in the blogosphere. A video podcaster went to an appearance of Mitt Romney in Iowa and questioned him about it, and that's where Mitt Romney said lighten up slightly. And that line then ends up migrating into the next snowman video that's produced and distributed via YouTube. So a really interesting circuit of amateur media working together to call attention to Mitt Romney and some of his political, political uh, supporters. Uh, and using CNN to, and other networks to their interest in the snowman to push that all the way back into the national news. So that, that, that these kids learned rather quickly how to move from play to politics. And that's part of what interests me about this, because for years I've been working on so-called audience resistance, appropriated popular culture, and people would always say, well, that's not real politics. If you write fan stories about Kirk and Spock, it's not really political. But what we're seeing here is all of those skills, all of those practices, the communities that support that, crossing over and doing stuff that we can't deny anymore is political, and it's having, starting to have some political impact on the ways people think about the race, especially at that crossover between amateur media and commercial media, which is the really interesting space that emerges in the selection process. Now, the question of whether the snowman is inappropriate is an interesting one, since political candidates have long used animated figures, packs of wolves, little kids pulling the daisy, petals off daisies to speak to us. So why shouldn't citizens be able to use cartoons to speak back to political leaders? The logic of the snowman video is consistent with two of the bigger tropes in American politics. The first is kind of identity politics trope in which you choose a group to embody your issue. So in the case of environmental politics, we could talk about weeping Native Americans and sort of classic 70s political advertising, or more recently, the role of polar bears as poster childs for global warming in Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. But the other is the use of the child as the figure of the future and the degree to which, for example, the classic Daisy ad represented the threat of nuclear war through the figure of a child. So while the Diddy off spoofs the question of parents being concerned for the future of their children, it nevertheless replicates it and uses that logic to frame, frame its question. So I don't think there's anything disreputable about the snowman video in its form. Quite the opposite, it was a very effective way of getting people to talk about the issue of global warming and what's disturbing is how rarely environmental issues have cropped up in the rest of the debates run by the established journalists, given the centrality of that issue to younger voters. So that, in fact, we can say the snowman did a really important service. Now, let's draw back a little bit and think about YouTube's role in the political process as a whole. And to do that, we need to think about what YouTube does. And first of all, you, I'm sort of interested in Yohai Binkler, who's a law professor at Harvard, who's written a book called The Wealth of Networks, in which he talks about the new digital space as a hybrid space where what he calls differentially motivated players come together, exist side by side. So his point is that we don't necessarily want to just talk about amateur and commercial, but we also want to talk about non-commercial players, activist groups, foundations, educational groups, 
governmental groups, all using the same platforms as both commercial players and amateur players. And so when you look at YouTube, one of the challenges is figuring out who put the content there and who made it, because all of those different functions exist side by side. And what the effect of that is, is these functions start to blur into each other. And groups that would be separated in physical zoning end up collaborating in this physical space of the web, in the virtual space of the web. And we're seeing new kinds of political tactics emerge in that space. The second thing to think about in terms of YouTube is that it's an archive for materials exerted by grassroots curators from the flow of mass media. That a lot of what's on YouTube came through mass media, but it gets more attention on YouTube. And we'll see, we, we talk about the fall campaign, you'll see some plenty of examples of that. But the Katie Couric interview would, would be a good example of something that most of you in this room, if you saw, probably saw through YouTube rather than watching it when it was originally aired. And the, avail the archival function of, of uh, CNN, of, of YouTube, meant that many more people saw that interview, especially in the scarcity of other interviews with Palin, than would have seen it otherwise. That it's, it's a moment frozen in time. And its devastating effect on Palin's reputation was in part created by our ability to go back to that archive and watch it when our friends told us about it or commented on So all of us in this room can talk about every quip, every mistake, every hesitation, every incoherence in the video. The third thing about YouTube is that it really is part of a larger system of social networks, which ensure the spread of media content. So YouTube, in the absence of blogs, of Facebook and social network sites, of LiveJournal, and the ability to embed content would not have anywhere near the effect. But it means, again, that as videos circulate, they can insert into a range of different conversations, and people can create commentary around them for very specific segments of the population. And so the same YouTube video can have very different political effects, depending on how it's surrounded by commentary. The video may inspire some groups to support its message, and other groups may be critiquing it, breaking it down, challenging it, making fun of it at the very same moment. And so that circulation of YouTube videos makes a huge difference as we think about the political effect. Now, these are just a couple of examples of the videos that began to circulate last fall via YouTube. One, one of them was a video that show, took the film Election uh, and the Reese Witherspoon character and juxtaposed it with Hillary Clinton. And you know, sort of, and sort of the overachiever who's angry at the, the the guy who comes in with just natural charm, beats her that she's entitled to the job and so forth became part of that video. The other is one that uses the Mac PC template to talk about the differences between Democrats and Republicans. But they're they're part of a larger process that illustrates a point that Binkler makes that as we move back from a world of mass media content to a more participatory media scape. We're going to draw on the imagery and language of mass media to express our ideas. That mass media is what we all have in common. It still has the power to insert its, its images in our, into our mind space. But we're going to take those images and remix them, repurpose them, recirculate them in new ways. And so it's not a surprise that as citizens gain the ability to take media into their own hands, they're mostly doing parody and mostly taking imagery from mass media as the basis for their political speech. And I think that's something we really want to pay attention to. I'm also interested in this qu quote from Stephen Duncombe, who wrote a book this, published a book this past year called Dream, which is really about the role of fantasy in progressive politics. So he says, given the progressive ideals of egalitarianism and a politic that values the input of everyone, our dreamscapes will not be created by media-savvy experts on the left and then handed down to the rest of us to watch, consume, and believe. Instead, our spectacles will be participatory. Dreams of the public can mold and shape themselves. They'll be active, spectacles that work only if people help create them. They'll be open-ended, setting stages to ask questions and leaving silences to formulate answers. And they will be transparent, dreams that one knows are dreams, but which still have the power to attract and inspire. And finally, the spectacles we create will not only cover over or replace reality and truth, but perform and amplify it. And so he's describing a set of tactics that I think emerge very vividly in the political process. Now, again, Binkler's point that this is a hybrid space is really important. If we look here, you see, for example, the 1984 spot, which took the Apple campaign and replaced it with Hillary Clinton. We see the Obama girl. We see Red State Update. We see Ask a Ninja. These are things that people often discuss as if they were amateur content. In fact, all of those are semi-professional content. In the case of the, the 1984 video, it was made by a ad, political advertiser in his off hours. Is that amateur? 
or professional, hard to tell. The rest of them are produced by people trying to break into the media industry. Uh, who, and um, some of whom had small businesses that were in the business of producing media. So what's important about the moment is that constant movement from amateur to professional, every step in between, plays a role in this process. And a lot of the stuff we saw as so-called viral content in this election cycle came from semi-professional media makers using it as a way of a calling card, in effect, to break into the industry. And that's an important part of the story as we look back at it. Now, this idea that we can use the imagery of popular culture to bring about political change is not unique to the campaign. These images represent the so-called anonymous movement, which created through a fan website called 4chan that uses the, the imagery of V for Vendetta, the Alan Moore graphic novel and film, to organize against the Church of Scientology. And they've organized massive protests all across the country, basically tapping the interest in the popular fantasy of resistance marketed by Hollywood. And it's just one of a number of examples of interesting groups at the present time who are fusing this line between popular culture and political culture. Now, one reason I think that matters is because most of us in this room are more adept at making decisions as consumers than we are at making decisions as citizens. And a lot of the research on younger voters says that one of the things that shuts them down is the language of politics, the ways in which we have developed a very inside the belt way wonkish way of talking about political process with a lot of specialized terms that don't necessarily invite you in. Whereas the use of popular culture imagery to explain some of those same issues seems to have the effect of allowing people to fall back on something much more comfortable to them and engage in the political process in a different way. That it's a gateway drug, as, as it were, into politics. That it creates a, a bridge between what people know, the skills we acquire in our play and recreational life, and what we do in our political life. And that's part of a larger process I describe in convergence culture, where really we are learning to play with information in ways that are quickly being converted into more powerful tools for education, for religion, for government. We're seeing these functions emerge that, uh, in part, because we play. It's not play versus politics. It's play as politics, and politics is play that I think is shaping the process. Now, rather quickly, the politicians themselves got involved in that process. And if we want to talk about adept use of new media in the election cycle, we have to acknowledge the role of Mike Huckabee. Mike Huckabee was bottom, bottom ranked candidate with almost no money, was the last man standing against McCain and the Republican Party, in part because he understood how to appeal to evangelical grassroots media producers and circuits, and because he had a playful sense of humor, which allowed him to circulate through parody. And so the decision to bring in Chuck Norris to do videos for Mike Huckabee ensured a lot more airtime on television, ensured a kind of spread between those two groups, and really made a difference. And Huckabee regularly appeared on The Colbert Show during that time, looking for the so-called Colbert bump. And that is the growing awareness and interest that people feel after they see someone on Colbert. The other example of this, not, not nearly as successful, is this video of Hillary Clinton released early in the campaign process where she spoofed the final moments of Sopranos, using herself, former president of the United States, and the first daughter to uh, stage scenes from Sopranos. I think the goal was to show that this woman who had led moral crusades against television violence actually liked popular culture and had a sense of humor about herself. But I think the message was too far out of uh, the scope of what people wanted to see from Hillary. And I don't think it had nearly the circulation and visibility that some of the other videos achieve. So there's got to be a fit. There's got to be a logic in the relationship with these candidates to parity that leads to that spread. Now, Obama emerges as the man for all platforms. That is, if, if Dean's campaign thought about a cyber candidacy and lost it on television, Obama's people, who were often in the same, in many cases, people, uh, veterans of the Dean campaign, rethought it and said, we've got to get this guy out in every platform. We've got to put him on television. He's got to be good on TV. But we also got to tap every new media system that's out there, from putting video advertisements into video games to using mobile phones. We've got to put him on social networks. We've got to use YouTube effectively. We've got to allow his image to be appropriated and spread across the internet by his supporters in such a way that people feel a sense of ownership over the Obama campaign and a sense that they're actively shaping the message. And there's so many ways that the Obama campaign coming out of the tradition of community organizing and building from the bottom up 
learn to use these new media platforms. We could talk about Facebook as a platform. You know, if we think about the traditional relation of a website to the voter, it's one where there's a direct sort of back and forth between the campaign and the voter. But a social network site allows voters to connect to each other in very powerful configurations. So the people could quickly deploy on the ground and organize local events or even national events around specific overlapping interests, connect with other voters and launch them. So much of the organizing took place without the control of a campaign, but people taking it on themselves to do something for Obama. You think about that model, if Obama does get elected president, then he has got a system for governance that's equally powerful, that those groups can be mobilized to write letters if Congress gets in Obama's way, to, to, to flood the news media. It's a really powerful base of operations. It's also one that you could swap in any other progressive candidate or progressive cause, and a significant number of those voters could organize around it using that same network very quickly. So it forms the base for a progressive political culture that is going to be in place for a long time to come. The other thing is, of course, the use of mobile phones. When I was in Boston waiting in the freezing sleet and rain for three hours to get in to see Obama speak, they were passing out the voting sign-up sheets for undecided voters. And people were using their cell phones in the line to call the undecided voters and charge them up about Obama. And then when you got inside the auditorium, as Obama's speaking, people are holding up their cell phones to broadcast his talk to people that they connected to via the mobile phone while waiting in line. It was a very powerful system of turning every cell phone in the crowd into a tool for the campaign. And not just part of the logic of the Obama campaign. Now, research has taught, Justin Cassell at Northwestern has done research on speech linguistic structures of leadership of between adults and youth. What she found was adult leaders tend to use an I formulation, like I feel your pain, or I'm ready to be chief executive on day one, these kinds of formulations. Whereas younger people who grow up in social networks tend to use a we formulation, like what are our, what are our, what's our agenda? What are we going to do about it? Uh, and so when you hear Obama use we so much in the early campaign, it is a factor that shaped the response, I think, of young people who live in an era of collective intelligence to the, the Obama campaign and made a difference, I think, in the way they perceived this candidate. Now, this bit about social networks is important. And it, it sort of challenges Robert Putnam, who's sort of an established figure in the field of civic engagement. Putnam's argument was that in the politics of the 1950s was dramatically shaped by the availability of civic organizations. And his example of civic organization, interesting enough, is the bowling league. So if you think about bowling, these guys would go on a Friday night. They'd bowl. It's a slow process. One, only one person's bowling at a time. Everyone else is on the back bench talking to themselves. They talk about all the issues of the community, and it mobilizes a sense of social cohesiveness. And his argument is that television broke that down, that television privatized American society, meant that people didn't necessarily gather in social tubs on Saturday night, Friday and Saturday night, didn't have those conversations, and it sort of destroyed the foundation of American civic life. Well, whatever is happening when we talk about the online world, stuff like this doesn't look like bowling alone, right? That people are now actively gathering through play on Friday and Saturday nights out of a sense of mutual obligation. They're involved in an activity that brings them together on a regular basis with people of very diverse backgrounds. And they're involved in conversations that extend beyond the immediate gameplay to connect to each other. The difference is they're doing so in virtual spaces rather than real spaces. And they're doing so without regard to physical geography. So that the social network as a political structure emerges in response to the increased mobility of American society in the second half of the 20th century, a time when the average American moves once every five years, often across regions. Alvin Toffler, as of the 1960s, had predicted we'd have less direct less commitment to local friendships, that we would sort of see friends as disposable. We wouldn't know the guy across the hall from us. What he didn't predict is a technology which allows us to carry our friends with us as we move across regions. And so social networks are building up stronger ties over time and form the basis of a different style of politics that's not geographically located, but is very powerful in its influences. And we're just now in this election cycle beginning to study how you mobilize social networks effectively for political change. Now, another one of my favorite stories of the campaign in sort of the relationship with participatory culture is the story of the 3 a.m. girl. Many of you will remember Hillary Clinton's spot, uh, the girl's asleep. The question is, who would you want answering the phone in the White House at 3 a.m., Hillary Clinton uh, or Obama? 
an answer most people would say is probably her husband, but, uh, you know, but nevertheless, uh, the 3 a.m. girl was sort of emblematic of that phase of the career. And um, the interesting story is the 3 a.m. girl turns out to be a real person uh, who was, had from the picture you see was found footage her family signed off on seven or eight years before. She's now 19 years old. And she made her own video in response to the 3 a.m. ad that I think is worth looking at. Hillary Clinton recently used stock footage of a little girl sleeping peacefully to make a political ad, the kind of footage normally used in commercials for pajamas and cough syrup. But she wanted to scare you into voting for her, first by tinting the footage blue, then by adding a scratchy voice. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. That little girl in the stock footage was me, eight years ago. And I'm here to tell you that I'm not scared. I reject the politics of fear that Senator Clinton uses to drum up votes. Long before I even saw this ad, I had embraced hope and volunteered for Barack Obama as a precinct captain in Washington state. I'm so proud of what I've been able to do in this campaign. Find out how you can get involved at BarackObama.com and reject the tactics that drive us apart. I'm Casey Knowles, and I approve this message, <laughs> and not the other one. <laughs> so a very interesting use of YouTube by uh, young, a young woman uh, in the political process to sort of challenge dominant media constructions of, of the campaign. And I think just one of so many powerful moments we saw where YouTube was being used to talk back to the messages of mass media throughout the process. Now, I don't want to make it all sound like YouTube was lofty. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we'd want to talk about is how the archival function of YouTube led to the Reverend Wright story, that so many of the YouTube videos of Wright started surfacing the mass, forced the mass media to respond to it, and it really is a story that began bottom up. The same would be true of the, story, the images of Palin being exercised uh, at her church in Wasilla, which didn't get nearly the same level of media attention, but also circulated through YouTube and became a, a weapon in the political process. So that it's, you know, that we're seeing, you know, it, it's not necessarily the case that a participatory culture is full of civic vir virtues, but it's, it's a complex picture that we have to think about as we think about the process. The same would be true of the blogosphere. This cartoon's about Obama's comment about P Pennsylvanian voters being bitter and clinging to religion and guns and so forth. Uh, the, uh, that story surfaced because a blogger attended an off-the-record rally for Obama in California. And questions, comments that would have previously been not reportable because journalistic ethics would prohibit it was picked up by the blogosphere and then picked quickly relayed by the Huntington Post, Huffington Post, and then from there spread outward through the media. It turns out the same blogger got the story about Hill, Bill Clinton bashing the reporter who wrote the Vanity Fair story about it, calling him a scumbag. So this is the blogger who got two of the most quoted comments of the primary season, but did so in a way that may, would have been unscrupulous by traditional journalistic ethics. And so it again poses an interesting question about what's the function of blogosphere during this time. The same would be true of the video footage we have of John McCain singing about bombing Iran, which Obama raised during the presidential debate. But it was a cell phone camera that captured a candid moment at a campaign stop and put it up over YouTube. So the sense that this, there's constantly stories that originated, made it to mass media in this election cycle, that originated because bloggers and podcasters have different kinds of access and less conspicuous equipment than that of traditional journalists. And it's part of what we're going to have to think about as we go through this cycle. Now, it's, not, it's too simple to see this as old media versus new media. Because I think one of the things we're seeing is that when new old media does stuff that's spreadable, it gets picked up and circulated via YouTube, and in fact, many of us are more likely to see it there than any place else. So these are some of the snapshots of Saturday Night Live as it played out in the spring of last year. We saw the spoof where Hillary Clinton uh, is being treated badly by the press and Obama's being offered pillows during the debate. This was followed by Hillary Clinton making that joke during a presidential debate referring directly to the Saturday Night Live video knowing that the video would then be available online and people could go back and see the video they missed. And that began the sort of interest in the cycle. And then the following week, she, this anchor, she appeared on Saturday Night Live herself, 
alongside the spoof version of Hillary Clinton, something that predates and predicts Sarah Palin's similar appearance along Tina Fey just a few, few weeks ago. So this becomes part of a whole process. And of course, here's Tina Fey, who had a memorable comment saying that she wanted Hillary, she supported Hillary because Hillary was a bitch, and bitches were the new black, uh, and that sort of bitches get things done was Tina Fey's comment. So Tina Fey had been one of the first to call out the, mass, the mainstream news media for its sexist treatment of Hillary Clinton. And it's significant that the first Tina, pa or Tina Fey Palin skit was similarly about sexism and the treatment of female candidates, and only later took on the importance of being about whether she was competent to perform the job. It was, its initial message was about feminist politics. So what's interesting, what we're seeing is that the Palin spoofs on Saturday Night Live have gradually driven up Saturday Night Live's ratings. That the appearance when she appeared alongside uh, Tina Fey was the highest rated show in a dec episode of Saturday Night Live in a decade. Um, but it turns out, by and large, ratings drop after the opening sketch because no one's putting good content in the rest of Saturday Night Live. People have figured this out. And the sketch, and many, many more people now are watching the sketches either through the network site or through YouTube than watch it when it's live. And that's true even of the Palin live appearance that, uh, that in fact, that, that was a tip of the iceberg compared to the number of people who watch it online. I was speaking to a senior citizens group recently, and almost everyone there had seen the Saturday Night Live sketches, and most of them had not stayed up late on a Saturday Night Live to watch it. They had downloaded it. So that what, and it's interesting, given our stereotypes that young people are the ones who do downloading, that this was sufficiently to motivate seniors to, do, to actively learn how to use the technology in order to access that content. But that the content has become so central to the election process that it really has shaped how we understand Sarah Palin. And the other thing that it did was draw people back to the original Katie Couric interview circulating on, on YouTube. So that people wa wanted to see that spoof, which was dead on the, the you know, personation of the interview. And when people saw the fit between the comedy sketch and the interview, it really colored the way people understood Palin through that interview process. Now, the, the uh, McCain campaign sort of has responded to this blurring of the lines between popular culture and politics. And it's interesting to see one of the videos that they put up, that they put on, online late summer, uh, which I think speaks to this tension about the relationship. And in London, Paris, and Berlin. Now, you too can join the Ones Fan Club right here in America. You think Elvis or the Beatles had come to town. This is amazing. I almost felt like crying when, when, uh, when he signed it. The perks are amazing like a tax increase for everyone earning more than $42,000 a year. He's a rock star. Oh, I'd say he's at the level of Bono for me. <laughs> Able to move appetites with just a local appearance. You could feel it building at the Taco Bell across town just before lunch. We're not usually busy whenever it's raining, and it's been busy all day. So act now and don't delay. We know he doesn't have much experience and isn't ready to lead, but that doesn't mean he isn't dreamy. The aura around him is just really nice. What I love most about him is that he has very soft eyes. Hot chicks dig Obama. <laughs> so this is, a re this is a rather interesting uh, campaign video. It, it's part of the same series as the celebrity videos that got a lot of media coverage. This one didn't get nearly as much, but it's more troubling to me because of the way in which it makes fun of civic engagement and the supporters of Obama and basically falls back on the same stereotypes about fans that I wrote about 20 years ago in Textual Poachers, right? That fans are brainless consumers, they devote their lives to worthless knowledge, they place an important, appropriate importance on devalued cultural materials, their social misfits, we're obsessed with the show that forecloses other social experiences, are feminized and or desexualized, are infantile, emotionally and intellectually immature, are unable to separate fantasy from reality. This is the stock set of stereotypes that circulate around fans. And so this idea of Obama's supporters as fans uses this anti-fan discourse to try to discourage young people in particular from participating in the political process. And it grows out of an anxiety about the emotional intensity of people's b belief in the Obama campaign. So it's, I think it's, more should have been made of it at the time. Now, it's worth, you know, the McCain campaign was, while the McCain campaign has been much less effective at mobilizing uh, new media for its efforts, 
There's at least one example when it, when it was very shrewd. This is the Wikipedia entry for Sarah Palin. And the Wikipedia entry turned out to be the most heavily viewed Wikipedia entry in a single day in the history of Wikipedia, right? If you think about it, you have an unknown candidate, no it was never heard of before. What's the first thing you do when you hear about her nomination? You go to Wikipedia to read more about her. Now, if you looked closely, 75% of the content of that page, the day that most people saw it, was written in a 12-hour period from midnight and noon on the day of the Palin announcement. And you have to ask yourself, who was up at midnight adding enter information to a post on Sarah Palin, right? It's unlikely very many people outside of the McCain inner circle were. And that's, in fact, what turns out to be the case. Now, what's interesting, so you could say this is an example of how Wikipedia misleads us. But in fact, it's all transparent because Wikipedia leaves traces. You could see how quickly it was updated. You could see who did the updates. And so this was something my MIT students called to my attention the same day as the Palin appointment. It was very transparently there if you knew how to read Wikipedia. But it was an attempt to in manipulate the information system that was there. And I think a rather interesting one. All right. So here's, here's Sarah Palin. Um, and this is one of those images that use Photoshop that people thought initially were true, right? And we have to talk, as we talk about the role of new media in this election, about the role of rumor. That the Barack Obama is an Islam, Islamic is a rumor that circulated mostly through the internet to the point that a large percentage of Americans, 10 to 15 percent, depending on which poll you read, believe it to be true. The same thing happened on the left with the Sarah Palin images that originally circulated, like this one, which were totally manufactured images. Uh, and became part of the way people thought about who Sarah Palin was. This juxtaposition of the babe vice president with the gun, with the moose hunter Palin, became a sort of central figure by which people understood her, and it was partially manufactured. And that's a rather disturbing use of, 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 of Photoshop. More interesting to me is the use of Photoshop as a kind of editorial cartoon. Right? So these are some from the spring. We see driving Ms. Hillary with Barack Obama as the chauffeur. We see Kill Bill uh, with Hillary, uh, of course, taking aim at a certain member of her family. And we see Barack Hussein Obama and, Bo and a spoof of Borat. Now, I'm not necessarily endorsing these. In fact, part of what I wanted, the point I wanted to make with these is just to suggest that a, pop a participatory culture may, in fact, sink lower in its treatment of sexism and racism than the mainstream media does, because it doesn't face the same limits and constraints and consequences for its action. But also what interested me is the way Photoshop has emerged as a tool by which average people can mash up images and create images that speak to their immediate concerns. It is for the popular, for the popular media what editorial cartoons are for the mainstream media. right? And these things serve much the same function. So that the Palin nomination, I, I sent the discussion of this on my blog, I just brought a few of them in, sort of captures uh, the, the responses often are incredibly revealing about the anxieties of voters around this nomination. So we see Eros and Thantos uh, brought together in this image of McCain and uh, Palin. We see uh, the spoof of Juno, <laughs> right, as the way of responding to Bristol Palin and calling attention to Sarah Palin's views about birth control and uh, sex ed classes. We see this one uh, that sort of captures on the gun-loving uh, side of Sarah Palin. The, the notion of superheroes becomes really a powerful device uh, in this election cycle. Lots of superhero images out here. This is a more pro-McCain Palin with superhero and Wonder Woman. And I sort of know where that came from, because the first time I saw Palin with those big glasses and the, and the hair up, I, th I thought, you know, that's a, that's a secret identity, right? This woman who goes out and hunts in the wild and, you know, strangles her own food, you know, uh, you know that's, that's sort of, this is, this is Wonder Woman, right? This is Diana Prince in her earthly garb, uh, who then goes out and sort of battles the elements on the side. And I sort of was waiting for tonight, I thought, there would be this moment when she pulls, lets her hair down and removes those glasses and has a sultry look to the camera, like every ugly, pretty woman we've ever seen in a Hollywood film, uh, because it's all set up uh, to look like, you know, she's supposed to be sort of librarian-like, yet very attractive, and that sort of fits within the iconography of superhero. The Democrats turned it around and talked about, he's not a maverick, he's a sidekick, 
uh, which sort of uses him as Robin to Bush's Batman. Uh, and then most recently, some of you will have seen the video of uh, John McCain dressed to look like the penguin. Someone doctored a footage of John McCain talking about Palin and doing his ah, ah, ah sort of sound. And it's, it's such a wonderful encapsulation of what's a little creepy about that mannerism that suddenly you can't look at him again the same way once you've seen him with a top hat and an umbrella under his arm and you know, clearly being framed as the penguin on content that's circulated via the web. This is a poster that reverses the superhero imagery again. And here we see uh, Bat Obama and Rob Biden uh, uh, next to uh, Catwoman and uh, the Penguin, which is this, is, this is a graphic that was circulating on Etsy, the, the arts uh, website, uh, fairly recently. And this is an interesting image uh, for those of us who grew up watching Dr. Strangelove of how people might perceive McCain. So these images that are created by average people and then circulating anonymously via the web play more and more of importance in sort of allowing us to express our political feelings, that they're content we pass along to other people. Um, now, you know, what we know politically is that the, 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 content, the most powerful political messages are those that are given you by someone you know and care about. So that while it's great that people volunteer time in swing states that knock on the door, much more important for them to con people to contact people you know. And the stuff that you can pass along, if accompanied by messages and comments, or even simply as a personal statement about politics, may well have some real impact on the way voters think because of that tendency of people to share and care about what their friends tell them about the political process more, far more than they care about what's on the news. This graphic. The sort of Shepard Farley graphic of the Hope poster has been, of course, spoofed by this picture of, no, of, of uh, McCain's Nope. Uh, but it's also when I was in Chile the other week, uh, I saw uh, campaigns there for local political candidates that were done exactly like the Shepard Farley uh, template. They took the graphics, the colors, used them for local candidates. And it suggests that the influence of these tactics are going to have globally in really short order. And what I found out while I was down there was lots of people in Chile were deeply following this election. They knew every line from the debates. They'd all watched the debates. They knew the nuances of all the issues. And I'm sitting there staring at them, not knowing anything about contemporary Chilean politics because of the lack of foreign correspondence in American news media, and sort of thinking about the mismatch between a world that's eager to engage with us, especially if we elect Obama, and our inability to understand that world because of budget cuts on mainstream newspapers have sort of cut off our access from a lot of international information. And so I think there's a lot we'll need to think about if we do move toward less a unilateral and more toward a global culture. Now, this is sort of my contribution to political culture. I was interviewed on NPR about Spock and put on the spot by a reporter asked me to say, what contemporary figure is most like Spock? And the fan in me is circling through figures on Battlestar Galactica or Heroes or Lost. And I'm going, these shows are so marginal that most people will not recognize the name of the character. And suddenly the reference popped in my mind. And I said, Obama, right? And indeed, as I started to explain, that Spock was of mixed race ancestry, part Vulcan, part human. And the show consistently made the argument that such a person was best to mediate between the alien cultures they encountered and the Earthlings aboard the Enterprise. So this idea of a mixed race person who can mediate between worlds had a deep root, especially in relation to the multicultural crew on, on board the Enterprise. And that the fact that Obama spent time being raised by his human mother and time being raised by his Vulcan father, that he went through a period of time in which he went overboard in Vulcan religion and became a kind of religious extremist, and then found his way back again there was a lot there to sort of think about Obama as a political figure in Spock. Uh, and it, I think the imagery works very well. It turns out that, in fact, Obama is uh, very much a, a, a Star Trek fan, that <laughs> Leonard Nimoy supports Obama and tells the story of being, meeting Obama for the first time, and Obama greeted him with a Vulcan uh, salute. <laughs> so I think that there is actually a kind of, it's an interesting set of juxtapositions that he probably is motivated by the mythology of Star Trek. Well, within a week, the, these images started appearing on the web. 
And I've documented lots and lots of them. Once NPR ran the interview, they start, there was a whole movement of people creating images of Spock and Obama, including the marketing of the Obama Spock t-shirts uh, through the online uh, crowdsourcing uh, t-shirt sites, which fit alongside uh, Matrix Obama shirts, Battlestar Galactica Barack shirts, and Barack the Vampire Slayer shirts, uh, suggesting that, again, this idea of combining science fiction imagery with political imagery to talk about the utopian imagination of change was what had a kind of larger impact on this election cycle, that it was one of the ways people were making sense of this political process. In the world where public can nominate ideas for t-shirts and public can rapidly vote to get them into production, these shirts can spin out within hours uh, in response to any topical event, which is why you saw those earlier posters of Billion the Snowman being mass produced. These are some more recent things I found in the web of Obama and science fiction. Uh, and it makes sense that a candidate of change would be connected with other, a genre which is about the prospect of change and is a genre we use to imagine alternative futures for our society. Now, to close, I just wanted to sort of suggest, you know, I've sort of said a bunch of things about popular culture in this election. One of the things I would argue is sort of that the writers like Cass Sunstein have sort of argued that what digital media has done is allowed all of us to find a space where our, that conforms to our own ideological beliefs. And he talks about a kind of cyber balkanization, a tendency of liberals to join liberal sites, conservatives to join conservative sites, and have a sort of inside conversation. And it's a theory that makes sense up to a certain point. If we're talking about partisan political sites, that's almost certainly the case. But it's a sort of argument that only a law professor could make because it assumes we're mostly political. And yet most of us belong to many different online groups around very different axes of interest. So we might belong to a group because of our hobbies, a stamp collecting group, a gardening group. We might belong to a religious group. We might belong to a fan group. We might belong to you know, regional-based groups. Those groups have different axes and different conversations take place within them. And I would argue that popular culture has been particularly effective at providing a common ground for people to discuss political issues. Because after all, liberals can watch 24, conservatives can watch West Wing and do. There's a space in the middle where they can come talk about values and hopes and fantasies for the society. That's true up to a point. There are two recent studies that I cited in my blog recently that are showing that, in fact, our, our popular culture is becoming as segmented as our political culture. Nielsen just recently did the study of cable shows, and it sort of identified shows with the greatest Democratic, Republican, and independent viewership. So Democratic viewership, the Colbert Show report, that makes sense. We can all sort of see where that comes from. The Deadliest Catch, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Axemen, Tin Man, My Boys, and I Love New York. This concert, Republican shows South Park, Cash Cab, Damages, Battle 360, Doctor Who, The Bill Ingvall Show, and Rock of Love. And Independence, The Cleaner, Real Housewives of Orange County, The Next Food Network Star, Design Star, Army Wives, The Hills, and What Not to Wear, and Saving Grace. So very interesting uh, show. Now, I don't know what it says about me as a progressive that I end up watching more shows on the Republican list than on the Democratic list. And I have this deep fear that my TiVo thinks I'm a Republican. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, nevertheless, it suggests that, in fact, there's not an absolute match between these shows, but there is some sort of pattern that emerges. Now, the, a study done by the, uh, the Pew Foundation and the uh, Norman Lear Center in Annenberg dug deeper into this and, and tried to identify taste choices across a variety of categories by Republicans, Independents, and uh, Democrats, or they called them reds, blues, and purples, but I think we knew what that was about, right? And some of the things they found out was that Fox was, of course, the most heavily watched show among conservatives. 70% of conservatives they interviewed said they watched Fox News, and only 3% of liberals said they watched Fox News. That over 82% of, of conservatives said they never watched MTV. The only other network that, got, that was watched less often by conservatives was Univision. <clears throat> That liberals give, that 31% of liberals watch Comedy Central daily, compared to only 6% of all the other groups. Uh, 
Out of 15 TV and film genres, Arch Emerge is the one with the highest positive correlation to liberal viewers and the highest negative correlation to conservative viewers. And out of 15 musical genres, conservatives were li more likely than the rest of the respondents to listen to only two of them, country and gospel. What genre were they least likely to listen to? Not hip hop, not, not uh, rock or heavy metal as you might predict, but world music. And then world music is the form of music that conservative viewers were identified as least likely to pay attention to. So this, I think, raises some interesting questions about how taste in popular culture maps on to political beliefs, including the suggestion that across the board, in every category, liberals and independents are more, consume more different kinds of genres of entertainment than conservatives do. So is there some connection between the sort of narrowness of taste in one case and the breadth in the other in terms of political beliefs? It's, hard, it's too early to speculate, but it's very interesting studies. Now, one television show ranked, high, ranked almost equally viewed across liberals, conservatives, and independents. And I suspect you would not imagine what it is. It's House, a show that's about a misanthrope who badmouths everyone regardless of beliefs and backgrounds. Turns out to be the one show that could be watched with equal pleasure by people of all political beliefs. So I think we need to sort of learn from House how to get along with everyone or get along with no one whatever the message is, and uh, that this is, this is sort of seems to be the one foundation we have as a society that might allow us to have a conversation with each other about culture and politics. So I will close my formal remarks there and open it up for questions. That's no, fine. That's yeah, whichever. Okay. All right, so questions. Yes? Uh, how would you rate things like Luke Berry cartoons and Conrad cartoons and Victor's Not All Fiction as far as precedent for the new YouTube and things like that? Well, I mean, I think, I think definitely we could go back. If we want to look at American comic strips, we can go back a long way to see political humor that played an important role. So we could go back from Doonesbury, which was a certain generation's, or Boondocks more recently, or Secret, Secret Asian Man as another recent political strip that has a lot of, has a lot of, causes a lot of interest. Back to Doonesbury, back to Little Abner, back to Pogo, uh, all of which are strips that have had, have taken very strong positions on political issues. And we could go back earlier than that, but I think those are the ones likely to be remembered in this crowd. So yeah, the idea that we use humor for politics has a long history that we do it through television and YouTube is maybe newer, but even there we could go back to Pat Paulson's race for the camp presidency in 1968. Uh, you know, lots of other examples where we've seen mock campaigns via television that were part of the political debates of the time. What's different is the democratization process where anyone who wants to can put the content up via YouTube, and so there's a broader range of political humor now in this election cycle including some that is really, truly ghastly, that because of this ability of people to participate. Yes, another question. Yeah, I was wondering whether, you know, this vast array of new media practices that you described does it put any pressure on the sort of orthodox cultural studies conception of the political? Because I wasn't sure what your notion of the political is or was, you know. Well, I mean, I, 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 you know, cultural studies has had a very elastic notion of the political. Mm -hmm. So that notions of resistant reading have often been read as the political. What interests me about a lot of this stuff is that this connects to capital P politics, that this is the movement of resistant reading practices back into the political arena. So all of this stuff is directly tied to campaigns, elections, and so forth. So even if you don't want to believe the sexual and gender politics of resistant reading, as it's been described by cultural studies researchers for the last 20 years, isn't political, we have to be able to see the bridge between those practices and the kinds of things that are being used for explicitly political purposes in this election cycle. That it's sort of, this is the best, pow most powerful demonstration I can see, that culture is political and that we may learn through cultural politics how to re-engage in the body politic in new, new ways. So for my mind, this is deeply political in even the narrowest sense of politics we want to talk about. 
Now, I have a more broader sense of that when I want to talk about other things, but I don't need to go, go broad to understand what's political about these, of these productions. Yeah, in the back. Well, I, th I think it's a complicated question because we want to go back to the Federalist Papers. We're talking about something that was read only by an educated elite. The minute we broadened franchise to include non-landowning citizens and did, and did away with literacy tests, then you had to have a point where political discourse was broader to talk to people who didn't necessarily engage in the highest levels of political discussion. But we've seen it as very important to be able to convey messages to people in, in simple ways that nevertheless gave them some entry point into those issues. So, so I, would, I would say that this is an ongoing story that we're looking at where the broadening of who gets to vote leads to a shift in political language and we're just at a certain point in that process. Now I would say if you've heard the level of passion and engagement in this election last year, it's hard to say that, that it's, to it's been totally or trivial. Even, even in those cases where people are basing their decisions on false information, there seems to be some serious issues underlying those anxieties. That is, the, you know, the anxiety about racial change, for example, is one that I think people have been debating through the figure of Obama. The question of what America's relationship to the world is, is debated even by the gutter press as it deals with this campaign. And it's not wrong to see that as a central focus. Even the use of cultural signals to indicate deeper belief structures, such as the debate about flag pens. I don't actually think the flag pen debate is trivial. I think it, I think it, it signifies different attitudes and different belief structures at a fairly deep level. Now, it's not the most important question to ask, but if that signal carries with it a set of cultural meanings for you, it's not a trivial question to ask. It's a question that's seen as a way into a symptom of a broader pattern of beliefs. And the fact that many of us in this room see it as trivial is proof and con proof and fact that we would that there is a cultural divide in terms of how we relate to the flag and whether it's important to us or not, and whether we see displaying it as something we're comfortable with or uncomfortable with. Now, what gets trivialized in that discussion is the question of what we mean by patriotism. Because as a progressive looking at Obama speak, it's hard to imagine anyone who could speak about the American promise and dream more powerfully than Obama has. That Obama is someone who's mobilized the rhetoric of Frederick Douglass and Walt Whitman in powerful ways to capture an image of American society. And so I'm confused often by why this attack on his patriotism had the has had the impact and persistence that it did. And I think it's partially because it just as law and order was a code word for racism in the 1960s, patriotism is today that African Americans who have a history of slavery and whose civil rights were denied until very, very recently, are gonna have a much more ambivalent history relationship to some of the signals, symbols of American nationhood than other segments of the population. It's much harder to say unequivocally, America is the greatest country in the world if, you're, if you've gone through that history. And so patriotism becomes one of the ways we can talk about this di cultural difference that's brought about by differences in racial experience. And that, that's not trivial, it's an important question. I may disagree with the language in terms in which it's being debated, but I can't argue that it isn't an important thing to pay attention to as we go through this election cycle. But I think that, you know, what we're seeing is that it had diminishing returns as the election's gone along, that they bombarded Obama with every claim about his patriotism imaginable and talked about real Americans and un-Americans and so forth in the last days of the campaign. And I think it's hurt rather than helped the McCain effort to gain votes and the support. And so there's a backlash against that language of patriotism. So this question's a very complicated one. I've only scratched the surface, but I, I, I don't buy the simple dummying down hypothesis that I think that, in fact, we, you, we don't, as human beings, engage with things that are utterly meaningless, that the images we choose matter and shape our beliefs and, really, and express our beliefs in really significant ways, and things that which may on the surface seem trivial may speak to greater cultural divides that we need to be listening to. And that we, just as we don't want conservatives to dismiss um, 
some of the, the kind of important issues and imagery of the campaign, we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss conservative concerns that are being raised simply because the language they're being expressed in is not the language we would use to raise those, raise those issues. That we have to figure out a way to take seriously conservative views if we're going to move beyond a very polarized society to figure out one that can, you know, if we achieve this Obama image of a purple America, we've got to figure out a way to talk to each other. Yeah. Okay. Hi. In this world where bloopers are archived forever, does that mean that we're stuck with style over substance? Are we going to be um, doomed to people who are only really great in front of the camera, or is there going to be a way for regular Joes to get, or Josephines to get to the office as well? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I do think we have to deal with the archival function of this media. And I think 10 years from now, we're going to see candidates who are being skewered for what were in their Facebook pictures in high school. Right? We already saw this around Palin's future son-in-law, who had put up a Facebook page in which he talked about never wanting to get married, not wanting to have kids, had pictures of him groping other teenage girls, uh, which stayed up surprisingly long until someone snatched in the Palin campaign snatched it down because it undercut the, the, their, their narrative about family values that surrounded uh, the door, Bristol's pregnancy. So that's already a reality. For in, uh, anything we put on the web can and will be used against us in the court of public opinion. That's, that's simply what's going to happen. And no one anywhere can say anything that doesn't have the potential of being put on the web. Now, does that necessarily mean, again, trivialization or style over substance? Maybe, maybe not. I think you could argue that those bloopers that took root were those bloopers that spoke to really serious issues. So that when Biden said, talked about FDR talking, reassuring the country after the stock market crash, speaking on national television, it was a punchline on television for a day or two. But it didn't stick, right? Because it didn't really say, speak to anything we believed about Biden, and it didn't speak to any issue that was driving the campaign. Where some of Palin's bloopers that did have political impact or did go to people's concerns about her, her, her competency, had much longer shelf life. And so I think what we're, we are already, as a society, sorting out which of these bloopers are meaningful and which ones are not. That the footage of John McCain singing, bomb, 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 Iran, had a huge shelf life, because it spoke to deep anxieties we had about that particular candidate. And it was widely circulated and, and surfaced in the debate and so forth. It, it, it had a huge political impact. But that was because it spoke to things that people already believed to be true about McCain and reaffirmed a, a set of patterns uh, in his behavior. Uh, in the same way that I think the penguin analogy is really a very effective one because it does speak to something people were already uncomfortable about and couldn't put a name to. Suddenly seeing that ah, 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 as the penguin gave you a, a way of making sense of who he was. So I think we're sorting out the material. We may, we're bombarded with so much media that we, not everything sticks and not everything matters. Not everything gets spread by our st other segments of the population. And so the selection process is part of what we need to study when we see it. Not just does it exist on the web, but how many people are looking at it, how is it circulating, which populations are engaging with it. And that, I think, could determine whether it's style or substance. And it could be both. But I think it's mostly where the style matches the substance is where people really start to pay attention. Well, I, 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 I think that we can point to other examples of where the web has supported very nuanced political analysis. Uh, it's some incredible uses of the web. I often end by looking at Real, Real Clear Politics, which is a site that aggregates all the news coverage 
of the election cycle, all the op-ed pieces, the most important videos of the day, all the polling data, allows you to really look closely and systematically and read across your own political biases. And I think that's a kind of function of the web that served really a deep function for people who also, it created a common base for political junkies to compare notes through in this election cycle. And I, I, I can't imagine having gone through this campaign without having access to sites like that that I think do very good. We could point to blog, some blogs are deeply trivial, but you know, there are many, many examples of blogs from specialized interest that really focused on specific issues and agendas. I have a colleague who is a math guy who did a whole set of blog posts on, on statistics and statistical analysis and how polls are manipulated and so forth, which really mattered for a lot of the MIT students in terms of understanding the political process. I've been steadily writing on the blog about the media relations and trying to dig as deep as I can and understanding the constructions of candidates' images and throwing those out to the readership of the web who might not otherwise have access to media analysis. So it's hard to say that it totally trivializes the process, that it really is been a platform that allows pretty in-depth discussion. But it also allows for quick shorthand, which is the way I would read a lot of these images. It's not that there's not a lot of belief or a lot of argument behind them, it's that they encapsulate things. In the same way that a good editorial cartoon in the New York Times, or the New York Times, bad example because they don't have editorial cartoons, Washington Post, Boston Globe, LA Times, a good editorial cartoon helps us to crystallize an issue and solidifies an impression, but we don't just say the newspaper trivializes politics by writing editorial cartoons, we recognize that behind the editorial cartoon is a larger conversation. And so my belief is that much of these videos and images I'm looking at have behind them larger conversations. Certainly the people who created them looked hard to find the right language to talk about their concerns through, and that they communicated and grabbed the attention of people as a prod for other discussions. Not everyone did it that way, but I think that they have a potential use that's much deeper than you see if you simply look at the surface of those, of those images.